Welcome back. We are going to go back live to court. Now, again, this is out of the presence of the jury. The defense requested a hearing, and it's a rule of evidence hearing outside the presence of the jury, and we believe that they're trying to establish whether or not this witness would be truthful and therefore, I assume, whether or not she can testify. We're going to return to court live now in Tennessee versus Eric Boyd. So we did confirm the judge just said that he is issuing a ruling under Tennessee Rule 803, which Katie had already shared with us. Um, we're going to get back to you on more of the specifics of that, but I think it simply is laying out how this attorney needs to ask the questions, what the witness recalls or doesn't recall, and then how she uses prior testimony if she needs to with this particular witness. Now, Chris Albanese, thank you for joining us today, a security me. and employment litigation attorney. I want to talk to you about how do you handle witnesses when they wiggle around your answer. So for instance, I just want to point out, prosecution says you recall you were sworn in and the answer was, I guess so. How do you avoid those pitfalls? You want to keep the, the question simple as possible, especially when you have somebody who likes to massage around the answer. Just ask yes or no questions, ask them to respond yes or no and keep it as simple as possible. So this way they can't wiggle around those answers. Yeah, great advice. All right, Katie, do you know anything more that you want to share about Rule 803 and affirmative defenses and what you may anticipate out of this witness now? Well, 803.26 is really um, a provision that was actually adopted in 2009 in Tennessee that allows prior inconsistent statements to be substantive evidence. Now, that's different because a lot of time prior inconsistent statements are used to impeach to show that the witness is not telling the truth. Here, they want to use her prior inconsistent statements as affirmative substantive evidence in this case. Yeah. All right. So we are going to go back to court, but I must say I really appreciate and love my panel law and crime. Thank you. We're going to go back to court live. Well, now they're having a sidebar, and I suspect it's about the very same issue that they already had a hearing about, and that is the way in which the state is asking the questions versus the way the defense thinks that they need to ask those questions. Let me turn back to my esteemed panel joining us. Chris, let me ask you, um, if someone says, I do not recall when asked if, they, uh, if they've said something, like I don't recall if, what I said about the car, how do you properly use a prior court transcript with that witness. That's where you turn around and you refresh the recollection with the transcript. You probably said X, Y, and Z. Is this what you said? Were you truthful when you said this? And you I was always trained that what you do is you ask to approach the witness, you show them, you make sure defense is already seen, and you show them that transcript. Katie, I'm going to ask you next. I see you nodding, but you say, can you read line three? Did you say this, yes or no? Katie, how would you do it? I, I would do the same way. I mean, again, you can't impeach with someone who doesn't know and they're not sure. So you got to nail them down first. You have to say, okay, well, if you don't recall, um, are, did you give testimony on X, Y, Z date and may I approach the witness and you show them? Does this refresh your recollection as to what you said in response to that question? And then, then that cues them up to give an answer. If that answer is then inconsistent, then you can impeach. And you know, it's such a fine point, but I was always trained, you let the witness read it. They don't need to hear it in your voice, the jury doesn't. You want the jury to hear it in their voice when it's read. What about you all? Absolutely. You, the witness, the jury needs to hear the witness's voice, the witness's testimony, and their own words. Yeah. So, Katie, tell me about your opinion of this witness. I mean, she's slippery, right? You can tell she is slippery. How would you handle her differently? I would just. You can, answer, you can ask questions such that the common sense response that anyone would give would lead you in the right direction. For example, well, you know, when, when you testify, you wouldn't lie, right? You would never, if you were sworn on the Bible, tell a lie, would you? I mean, who would go up there and say that they would? This person, I think, is clearly not trying to throw their cousin under the bus and is trying to wiggle around as much as they can. So you can impeach with common sense as a way to getting where you need to go. But I agree with Julie. So, Chris, I'm going to ask you about this. You know, she, if, if you impeach then and she says, I don't recall or it wasn't true, she's committed perjury. Is anything possibly going to happen to her if she, in fact, admits that she perjured herself on the stand on the other three trials? Most time, prosecutors don't bother prosecuting for perjury. It's not something that you often see. All right. So it's going to be an interesting thing to see what this witness does at the end of this testimony and how it helps or hurts the prosecution. Let's go back to court and her testimony is resuming. So the prosecutor continues to ask questions of this witness about what she testified to about her white car with the red stripe, who she loaned it to, about a bag of a sandwich, clear sandwich bag of bullets in the car. And every answer that you can hear coming from this witness is, I don't recall, I don't recall. Katie, first, what would you have asked differently, if anything, to force some, some better answers out of this witness? I would first start with this idea of, well, 
you did testify in this case, right? And you testified on this date and you were asked to tell the truth and you were sworn in and you know that the penalty for lying under oath is perjury, right? So you told the truth on that date, correct? Because really what they're asking her is to remember what she testified to. They're not really asking her about the facts of the case. You can also ask, well, the testimony that you gave closer in time to the actual event would be better than your memory today, right? There's all sorts of peripheral questions that you can ask to corral these answers. All right, and Chris, we just talked about something uh, when we weren't on air, and that is, so I don't recall, is that lying by the witness or not? Most likely it's not lying because you're asking about something 12 years ago. So she might not remember. And I know I've always told witnesses in trial prep, hey, if you don't remember, that's what you need to say. You never want to make something up. You never want to lie. Do you find her credible? It's questionable. I mean, and part of it is, you know, we don't know if the defense investigator or someone from the defense team just kind of put that in her mind of, you don't really remember what happened, do you? And she's just going and running with it. All right, we're going to stay tuned. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to resume trial live. Gavel to gavel here on Law and Crime. Shoo, that witness is over. Let me just say that I think that the defense attorney summed it up nicely at the very end when he said, um, yes, I think that's clear about her not being able to recall or that she's been non-responsive. So let me ask you each. I'm going to start with you, Chris. Did this witness at all help or hurt either side? I don't think she helped or hurt either side. She just clearly didn't remember, and then it's up to the prosecution or the defense to manipulate that aspect of prior testimony to help their case. Did she not remember, Katie, or is she not saying, because this is her her cousin, who again, was not charged at the time the other co-defendants went to trial and she testified. Right, I, I think it's clear that she doesn't want to throw her cousin under the bus. And I can completely understand that would be a really awful situation to be in. So to that extent, I can see that it would somewhat hurt the defense because it looks as though she thinks that the information she has would hurt her cousin, right? Because otherwise she would just say the truth. So I think it can be twisted properly in closing to be construed in that light. And let's talk about what the prior testimony said. Now, again, she says she cannot recall this testimony from trials in 2008, 2010. But what the prior trial transcript seemed to indicate is that, number one, the white car with the red stripes belongs to her. Number two, that she did allow her cousin, who's now on trial in this trial, and that's Eric Boyd, to borrow that car either on the 6th or the 7th. And number three, that there was a clear sandwich bag of bullets taken out of that car. So on that note, we're going to take a short break and then we'll resume trial with the next witness. Short and sweet, Jerome Arnold. Again, he lived on the street, Chipman Street, where the two victims were taken. And he testified that at 1.45 a.m. he heard three pops. And he knows it was 1.45 because he knew it was way late. He was watching a show on TV. He looked at his watch, 1.45, three pops. So, Chris, first of all, did you find him credible? We know he's testified lots of times. But what are your thoughts? I found him very credible. His, he was factual. He was matter of fact. He even corrected the defense attorney when he had the direction wrong. I believe the defense attorney said northwest. He corrected him, said northeast towards the train track. So I find that very credible. All right. So I know that we expect there not to be any eyewitness testimony. So as far as I know, there's no evidence that anyone actually saw these victims being shot, tortured, raped, any of these things by this defendant. So given that, how careful or how hard do you think it's going to be for the prosecution to weave together all this circumstantial evidence and the gunshots and the car that may have been borrowed by this cousin? Is this going to be difficult for the prosecution to prove? I hate to put it this way, but after having it, after it being done already three or four times, it should not be that difficult for them. Okay. All right, Katie, we're going to come back to you in just a minute. We're going to go back to court. I was just looking at my monitor to see. I believe that they've called another witness to the stand. Another short and sweet witness, he had a very limited amount of involvement in this case, but very important. He testified that he saw smoke over by the railroad tracks. That was unusual. When asked by defense, he said just every once in a while, would you see something like that? He actually discovered Chris's body. Now, remember, Chris is one of the two victims in this case. They believe that he was executed shortly after he had been kidnapped taken, sexually abused, tortured, and then he was executed um, and shot. So let me turn it to my guests now. Let me start with you, Katie, because I know I left off before asking you this question. How effective do you think the prosecution's been so far? We're on the sixth witness. What's your assessment? 
I think that the hostile witness was a little rocky, um, but we have to understand that this is a long play, right? They're weaving together this tapestry because we don't have any of that direct evidence with the defendant. So a lot of this, hopefully, we're going to see come together very clearly in the closing where all of these facts are carefully woven together to show that the defendant committed these acts. All right. So let me ask you, Chris, we have a lot of situations here. We have a kidnapping. So you have a lot of different crime scenes. You have the kidnapping to the house on Chipman Street. Then you have a body in another place, which is Chris's, which this gentleman discovered. And then you also have the female victim, Shannon, who was found in a trash can after being put in trash bags. So you have have a lot of different crime scenes, a lot of different evidence, and you also have 38 counts against this defendant. How does that come into play with the prosecution's case? Well, that's where it takes, as you were saying, that it's a lot of weaving. You have different aspects. You take it slow, make sure the jury is following you along. You have to make sure that each point is registering with the jury about how that will weave later on in your closing statement. All right, and there's probably going to be a lot more evidence to come. We're going to take a short break and then we'll return to this trial here on Law and Crime Live. All right, so this is, in fact, the witness that did see the body. And he saw a picture you just showed. He identified on the picture of the Waterhouse and where it was. So they are piecing together this puzzle to show the jury all the different aspects of the evidence and what it shows and connect it to the defendant. Now, let me bring back in my esteemed colleagues. And let me start with you, Chris. So, so far, have you heard anything that gives you insight as to what the defense is possibly going to argue in this case? At, the, at this point, no. They've kept the questions very simple. They've kept questions uh, short. I don't know wh how they're going to put that together at this point. All right, Katie, what do you think? Is it he didn't do it, and that's the, the sum of it? Well, I think, that, I think that the smart thing that the defense has done is that they're not arguing with facts that are not in dispute. He's not coming out there and swinging at everything. We know that these people were killed horrifically. We know where the body was. I think that they're going to say, listen, this is a horrible crime. He helped clean up and help his friends after the fact, but there's absolutely no evidence linking him to the murders. That's right. And the prosecutor, I mean, the defense even said that at the beginning of their opening statement and said, yes, this happened to these two individuals. So again, we have Christopher Newsom a 23-year-old, as well as Shannon Christian, the 21-year-old. How much is the prosecution going to, and I want each of you to answer real briefly before we have to take a break. Chris, I'll start with you. How much do you think the prosecution is going to rely on the horrific nature of the crime and these two young victims to try to get the jury to convict? I'd have to say at least 75 percent. All right. What about you, Katie? What's your guess? They're going to heavily rely on the sympathy and also the connective tissue that this defendant already admitted that he helped to clean up. So there's already that connective tissue there. All right. Great points by my panel. You are not going to want to miss the remainder of this trial. We'll be covering it here on live on Law and Crime. So I need to say goodbye to my panelists. Thank you for being here today, Katie Smith, as well as Chris Albanese. And next coming on, our own Linda Kenny Bodden is our next host. She'll be here right after me. Judge Ashley Wilcott signing off. Thank you for sticking with us today. Today, gavel to gavel coverage here on Law and Crime.